yesterday I said uh, that there is a seal called Akusala seal and somebody asked me where we find that. I said you find it in uh, Samana Mandika Sutta in Majjhiminikaya where Buddha used the Kusala Sila and Akusala Sila. Kusala Sila is the Sila that we all observe to restrain and discipline ourselves. Akusala Sila means unskillful mental uh, ritualistic habit. For example, if somebody thinks if that person lights a lamp every day in the house, that will bring good luck or they will have uh, wisdom because light represents wisdom. By lighting a lamp or candle or oil lamp, uh, they might think that will bring them wisdom. And there are many such uh, rituals people observe as a habit. And these are called unwholesome habit in Akusala Sila. Uh, friends, it is, uh, the list is very long. I just gave one simple example. Many people do many different things in the name of uh, Dhamma, uh, thinking that they, that would uh, liberate themselves from uh, samsara. And that is a ritual <coughs> which and they attach to them. So that is one thing the Buddha discouraged. And uh, so long as people spend time on that, their attainment liberation will be retarded or will go away. Then the, the fourth uh, fetter, I was talking about fetters which are supporting ignorance. So ignorance, ignorance arises depending on these uh, fetters and there are underlying tendencies then uh, uh, also influxes, then uh, hindrances and fetters. They all uh, support, fetter supports everyone, every state of uh, defilement. And they have, uh, there are three stages the underlying lowest stage is Anusaya stage. Uh, Anusaya is sleeping with the uh, subconscious mind. The subconscious mind is not a Buddhist term. I just borrowed it from uh, other traditions. Anyway, it is called uh, a dormant state of uh, defilement. It's called Anusaya. When something triggers through our senses, when sensory objects are present, uh, depending on the object, uh, whatever sensory object is present, that instant this anusa becomes pariyuttana. Pariyuttana means arising. That is like uh, when you are sleeping, suddenly you hear a sound. Then you jerk up and uh, wake up. Uh, that is Pariyuttana state arising, defilements, uh, dormant defilement, dormant uh, mental uh, tendencies arise. Then the third stage is called Vitik Kama. Vitik Kama, Kama is uh, movement, Viti means the street or road, and uh, it then uh, go goes in the direction of doing something wholesome or mostly unwholesome because underlying tendencies are not wholesome. And then the uh, mind, body uh, becomes active to do something 
uh, following the certain wrong path and committed commit the wrong thing. That is called Kamapatha. So these are the four stages. Anusaya, Pariyuttana, Viti Kama, Kamapatha. Anusaya is underlying tendency stage. Pariyuttana means activity, rising uh, stage. And uh, uh, Viti Kama is uh, just, we trigger, we think of doing something in that direction and uh, Kamma Pata means committing the Kamma. So Kamma therefore begins from such a deep level and manifest through our thoughts, words and deeds and therefore they all have uh, li ha are linked or connected uh, with each other. So, uh, Feta is one strong stage just after uh, Anusaya, Anusaya. So then Pariyuttana stage, you will start, uh, Feta becomes active. You will see this very clearly in your mind. Then thinking of doing something even more clear, and then doing it even clearer, the final stage. So all these are related. Then the fourth uh, uh, fetter is called the fetter of uh, greed. Of course, this is most uh, commonly spoken uh, mental state. Uh, every day language, they use the word uh, greed. Uh, it is it's a definitely a fetter, uh, also called desire, that uh, is uh, uh, that is that binds uh, individuals to uh, other various things. It is so powerful and so strong, deeply rooted uh, as uh, Anusaya. Uh, fetter, hindrance, and then using it in our activities. And therefore it is the, one of the last things that uh, even Anagami, the one who attained the third level of enlightenment, destroys. Uh, it is uh, it's a residue uh, remains as uh, uh, conceit, uh, restlessness, worry, and all these are very uh, subtle underlying uh, mental states uh, among uh, fetters. Uh, so therefore, even in that stage, greed is there. That is why one has uh, the last fetter called uh, ahankara, I consciousness, uh, believing in the existence of some shade of I somewhere in us uh, until we attain full enlightenment, this goes. And that is why the Buddha said in uh, uh, Mahasatipatthana Sutta, uh, tasayeva tannaya Asesa, Viraga, Nirodho, Jago, Patinisvago, Mutti, Analyum. Several words he used to explain uh, the way how this defilement, this greed, uh, is, should be dealt. Uh, Asesa, Viraga, Nirodho. Complete cessation without remand of Greed, Jago, abandoning, Mutti, liberation, Analayo, not clinging, uh, Mutti Analayo. These are the stages of destroying the, the, the greed. So people, as may I mentioned in the past, uh, since they have ignorance 
and I uh, I ask people not to get upset with me when I mention the word ignorant. Everyone who is holding on to desire in what form, what size, doesn't matter, is ignorant. Ignorant of the suffering caused by desire, uh, ignorance that uh, it is this desire that uh, perpetuates our existence in samsara, not knowing all this, we commit all kind of deeds, which I mentioned later on, and the uh, Sankhara. So for now, I simply wanted to mention as a passing note uh, under ignorance, uh, greed, uh, as a supporting factor, nourishing factor of ignorance. With these friends, let us uh, uh, start our morning practice. <coughs> okay. Let us begin our practice. May all beings be happy and secure. May all beings have happy minds. Whatever living beings there may be, Without exception, weak or strong, long, large, medium, short, subtle or gross, visible or invisible, living near or far, born or coming to birth, may all beings have happy minds. Let no one deceive another, nor despise anyone anywhere, neither from anger nor ill will should anyone wish harm to another. As a mother would risk her own life to protect her only child, even so, towards all living beings, one should cultivate a boundless heart. One should cultivate for all the world a heart of boundless love and friendliness, above, below, and all around, unobstructed, without hate or resentment, whether standing, walking, sitting, lying down, or whenever awake, one should develop this mindfulness. This is called divinely growing here, not falling into erroneous views, but virtuous and endowed with vision, removing desires for sensual pleasures. One comes never again to birth in the womb. These are our daily practice of metta, and we very earnestly want to wish that all beings be very happy and peaceful. This is a wonderful, heartwarming, benevolent, wholesome thoughts. These we have to cultivate with it us and share it with everyone, especially those who are suffering these days due to this virus and we started this whole practice of meditation purely because of those individuals not that we should practice only during that time we should practice it always as Buddha said in the discourse whenever awake with this metta thought in mind, let us begin our practice. We focus our mind on our breathing. Pay attention to the in to inhaling. As inhaling, pay attention to exhaling as exhaling. Notice inhaling and exhaling as a pause between them. And then, as you pay attention to the breath in this way, you certainly feel the breath and you perceive the breath. You pay attention, deliberate attention to breath and you are conscious 
of the breath. These five I mentioned several times are the simplest or most simple way of uh, expressing five aggregates. Five aggregates, even if you try to find it in some other ways, you will see only feeling the, the breath, feeling, perception, thoughts, and consciousness. I put them in a very practical way. As we pay attention to them, we notice them constantly changing. As we breathe in, all the five arise. As we breathe out, all of them pass away. And new feeling, perception, and so forth arise when we breathe again. As we breathe out, they pass away. In fact, we even don't have to breathe in and breathe out. They arise, they don't wait when one inhaling is complete to change. They don't wait until next exhaling takes place for them to change. While we are inhaling and exhaling, feeling, perception, thought, and consciousness change very quickly in a very high speed. We hardly can notice all of them, but our awareness sees their gross superficial appearance, gross awareness. As we gain concentration, as we develop this, our greed fade away and attachment to anything fade away. Then restlessness and worry fade away, resentment or anger fade away, sleepiness and drowsiness fade away, and doubt fades away. When they fade away gradually, then the body becomes calm, relaxed, and peaceful. The breath becomes calm, relaxed, and peaceful. Mind becomes calm, relaxed, and peaceful. When we experience this, then our mind and body relax and then our, we experience a degree of insight. In that insight we see the mind let go of clinging. Then that arouses our loving friendliness and compassion. When these three take place, we experience more tranquil, calm state, which arouses our joy that leads to happiness. Then we gain concentration. When this happens, our mind becomes relatively clear, clean and pure because our defilements like hindrances have got out of our way and wholesome states like letting go, metta, compassion, joy, happiness, concentration arise. That make the mind even clearer, purer, and serene, composed. With this, with this state, our awareness of subtlest changes become very clear. So we experiencing all this, keep 
breathing in and breathing out without using any word to describe any of them to ourselves or name anything that, that we experience. Let them happen, let them arise, let them pass. May the suffering be free from suffering. May the fear struck be free from fear. May the grieving be free from grief. So too may all beings be. This is once again, I must say, our earnest wish, especially this time, as there are so many individuals, families, societies, countries, going through this very dangerous virus and we want to wish them to be free from it and never get it and those who are affected by this come back return to normal healthy life and live long in very good health and those who are trying to help them in many ways also be free from this virus and they also should be healthy and peaceful and all those who are supporting directly or indirectly in their thoughts, words and deeds also be free from this virus and may they all live long in very good health. Now friends, let me continue my little talk within this uh, limited time. I don't, uh, uh, I, I may not be able to explain all these things in detail. The fifth, uh, uh, when we say greed, I did not finish. Greed is uh, greed for sensual pleasures. There are various degrees of greed. Uh, desire for sensual pleasure uh, is one. Desire for material things is another. Desire for thoughts is another. And uh, Buddha said we can have desire for dhamma, uh, dhamma, rag. Uh, and Buddha said we must not only let go of a dhamma, but even the dhamma we should let go. That means we should not cling even to dhamma. Clinging to dhamma also is far more dangerous that would increase our ignorance of uh, danger of what we do with uh, uh, obsessed with uh, greed, thinking that this is the truth, everything is wrong, I am right, they are wrong, this comes from the uh, from uh, desire plus ignorance and therefore uh, we have to be very careful and mindful of desire. And as I mentioned once before, somebody
somebody can ask how can we live without desire surely if one wants to perpetuate samsara existing in samsara multiplying the world or populating the world surely need desire that is why the buddha said the anya ilabho panita anya nibbana gamini worldly life is one other worldly nibbana life is another mm. this does not mean that lay people cannot practice dhamma they definitely can practice they can all they need is understanding there are uh, stories in text in uh, buddhist pali text that uh, lay people having attained enlightenment while enjoying their uh, household life uh, there was uh, I, just for you to remember i tell you a little story uh, there was a, a woman called migalandaka uh, one day she invited venerable ananda and uh, for lunch at the lunch, she asked him uh, venerable sir my father uh, purana is my father's name when i was born he uh, began to observe celibacy when he passed away the buddha said that he has attained the second level of enlightenment sakadagami the stage called one returning stage and then my uncle my father's brother is it that uh, did not give up sensual pleasures he lived a household life enjoying sensual pleasures when he passed away buddha said that he too had attained the second level of enlightenment what i cannot understand when the verse is how come both of them attain the second level of enlightenment one is in celibacy the other not practicing celibacy then when the lion and the could not answer this question he uh, confirmed her reply her understanding and said uh, that is what the buddha said so he returned to the buddha and asked uh, him how can this be uh, that how can this to be then buddha said the uh, uh, purana was a very uh, pious faith oriented person faith oriented person observe uh, uh, celibacy and uh, makes his mind calm uh, without having any agitation excitement Uh, in uh, sensual pleasures and therefore he was able to attain the second level of enlightenment overcoming the first three fetters and his uh, brother siddhartha uh, was uh, a wisdom oriented person he was wise and he knew how to balance his life how to Uh, practice meditation when to practice meditation how to live without becoming attached to his uh, household life and uh, he to practice im- uh, meditation and see so impermanence impermanence in sensual pleasures danger of sensual pleasures and yet he was able to seeing this impermanence he uh, develop his uh, mindfulness his insight wisdom 
and uh, attain the second level of enlightenment. And that is even though they had the desire, they, such people attain the second level of enlightenment. Anatha Pindika, Visakha. Visakha is a very generous lady, very rich woman with a lot of sadha, faith in the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. When she encountered the Buddha at the age of seven, she attained the stream entry. Then she married afterward as she grew up and had many children. And therefore, uh, desire has uh, two aspects. Wholesome desire and unwholesome desire. Unwholesome desire is desire to perpetuate desire. Wholesome desire is desire to be free from desire. Desire to be desireless. And that is what anybody can practice with the monastic or lay people. Of course, the desire will vanish from the mind only when one attains the third level of enlightenment called anagami. Until such time, people uh, live household life and uh, practice meditation and gain uh, the stages of enlightenment. Then the fifth uh, fetter is called hatred. That is another very powerful uh, obstacle to attain liberation. Hatred also listed as a fetter because unlike other fetters, this is so, uh, this takes such a grip of our mind that uh, it is difficult for most people to let go of hatred, anger. If they don't hate anybody, they at least hate themselves. Uh, I have heard many a time people say, I cannot practice metta uh, to myself because I hate myself. I'm self-hating person and so on. If they don't hate others, at least they hate themselves. The desire is not like that. Uh, desire we can see uh, that is uh, coming and going and it can be uh, reduced, but hatred uh, can be reduced with the great greater effort uh, and uh, also will overcome or will uh, disappear only when one attains the third level of enlightenment. Hate, hateful uh, state of mind also in our vision uh, Buddha compared it to a, a boiling water on the water on the one hand is uh, hot on the other hand when it is hot and boiling you cannot see the bottom and it is very uh, disturbing and uh, i don't have to explain how hard how difficult to get rid of hatred is it any it uh, confuses persons and block his uh, mind from seeing and thinking clearly. When the mind is muddled up with the anger or hatred, his, that person's words are not right, thinking is not right, feeling is not right, and the person will always be burning. And that also is called uh, fire, uh, fire of anger. Uh, and that is why when we practice metta, this fire of anger will be, will not affect us. This is one of the uh, benefits, relevant benefits of metta practice. They are here 
the one uh, benefit is uh, that the meditator, metta meditator, will not be affected by fire, poison, and weapon. The fire, the sometimes people uh, not understanding the real meaning of this, uh, ask uh, how uh, when you practice metta, uh, we will not be affected by fire, poison, and weapon. While we are practicing, fire can affect us, poison can affect us, weapon can affect us. For instance, when we are meditating, met practicing metta, if somebody comes behind and stab us or shoot, definitely the bullet or the knife goes through our body. If somebody set fire to us while we are meditating, we certainly will be burned. Now here, fire, poison, weapon are uh, figuratively speak, figurative sp speech. Uh, fire, poison, weapon refer to greed, hatred, and delusion. Buddha mentioned this uh, Aditya Pariyaya Sutta in Sangvita Nikaya. Uh, Raga Gina, Dosa Gina, Moha Gina, Raga fear, Fire, Dosa Fire, Moha Fire, Greed Fire, Hated Fire, Ignorant Fire. So, Greed is Fire, Hated is Fire, and Ignorance also is Fire. And uh, Buddha said, We are burning on this fire every day and uh, blocking our view. So uh, that as uh, uh, fetter, it is very, very powerful fetter. The sixth fetter is greed for fine material existence. People who have the body, uh, they know as long as we have body, we fall sick, we grow old, and uh, we have all kind of aches and pains. This, co this uh, coronavirus affects us since we have a body. And so for so many things happen to this body. There are many sicknesses. Uh, some can be cured. Some can never be cured permanently. Some cure, some can uh, have a permanent, uh, uh, can be cured permanently. Some will never be cured permanently. There are six kinds of such sicknesses. When I mention one, you may even laugh. How can that be a sickness? But that is a sickness. It can, it can be temporarily cured, but never permanently cured. For instance, uh, cold. When it is cold, it is cold. You cannot cure it permanently, although you may stay home and uh, have a heat, uh, put in a lot of warm clothes and so forth. But cold does not go away as soon as you get out. Cold is there. When cold season is there, we feel cold. Whenever we feel cold, we feel cold. But temporarily we can take care of it by using warm clothes and fire, warm houses, and so on. Then heat. When it is hot, we feel hot. We feel the heat. And temporarily we can have ACs and so on to get rid of it. But it is temporary measure. But we get cold, we, we get uh, warm hot again. Then hunger. When we are hungry, we are hungry. And when we eat, hunger goes away. And hunger will never be uh, cured forever. That is why we have to eat every day to get rid of our hunger. Then thirst. Uh, thirst also is like that. Temporarily, we can quench it by drinking water. 
or whatever liquid and we will be thirsty again. Then uh, passing urine, we have to pass urine, we can never stop it, never cure it permanently and defecation also is yeah, temporarily we can cure by uh, passing but uh, it comes back again like that so long as we have this body we have all sort of things we have to take care of the body and so on so and so forth therefore some people may, when they meditate they think uh, attaining a fine material existence would be better than this gross physical body so they meditate hoping with good intention uh, hoping to get to attain that stage called fine material existence rupa rag there again is desire that desire is to exist in a very fine material form uh, not to uh, worry about taking care of this gross body they wish to stay at that level and that is uh, the uh, sixth fetter I think uh, uh, the remaining four fetters I can discuss uh, tomorrow because if I use all of them very run through them very quickly you may forget all of them so let me take it easy and you take it easy and we try to understand now still we are talking about uh, uh, dependent origination the first factor is ignorance and because of ignorance we have all these uh, many countless problems and uh, this ignorance is uh, nourished, supported uh, by these uh, fetters, yes, hindrances, underlying tendencies, influxes and so forth. These keep nourishing our ignorance and that is why I want to mention these things in this uh, series of little talks. And once again, we meditated very sincerely, honestly, uh, wishing all those who are suffering and wishing them to be free from suffering and attain liberation and uh, liberate from the suffering and finally attain Nibbana. For now, let all of them return to their normal, healthy life and live long in very good health and enjoy their life. With this, I want to say good day and see you this evening at 7.30.